Hi folks, welcome to this Eden webinar. As we're waiting for people to come in, I see about 40 people in so far. Please introduce yourself in the chat. Tell us where you're from and what the weather is like. Um, in Dublin today, I can report it's terrible. So I only want to hear nice weather if, if possible, please. Uh, so we're delighted to welcome you to this uh, webinar about changing assessment due to COVID-19 experiences and impact. Uh, and we have some fantastic speakers lined up um, who I'll introduce in just a moment. I'm just going to allow a few more people to join. Salzburg. Mm. Croatia, much rather be there, I can tell you. So I'm just going to share my screen. Um, just a, a few things about the NAP. If you if you're new to to this web, uh, to this group uh, or this webinar, it's the uh, Eden Network of Academics and Professionals, and we do things like run networking events, collaboration, uh, and also webinars like this. Uh, and occasionally we also do tweet chats called Eden Chats. Um, so this is the steering committee. Just to briefly introduce us and. Also, just to tell you a little bit about our speakers, the first speaker is going to be Dr. Monica Ward, then followed by Professor Stilianos Hatsapangos from the University of London, uh, and presenting with uh, Dr. Linda Amrain Cooper, also from the University of London, and followed by Dr. Inez Gil Huerrina from UNED in Madrid. Um, so, I'm going to hand over then to our first speaker, which is Dr. Monica Ward. So, Monica, if you want to start getting your slides ready and I'll introduce, read your bio. So, Monica is an associate professor and assistant head for teaching excellence in the School of Computing at Dublin City University and a colleague of mine. She has extensive experience in teaching and assessment in a range of subjects from technical to trans transversal skills. She is a pioneer in the use of technology in education. She ad advocates for co-creation and culturally responsive approaches with academics and students. Over to you, Monica. Grant, everybody, thanks for coming along today. Um, it's uh, terrible having to listen to your own bio, but there you go. Um, so Orna has said who I am. So don't, don't believe the hype as we, as we move through this uh, presentation. So uh, first of all, um, just kind of give you a very brief overview of what I'm going to be talking about. So I'm going to just look at academic integrity um, and kind of come up with a checklist for alternative assessment. And then we're going to look at different types of alternative assessment that we might have and some samples and tips. So um, I'll try and keep an eye on the chat as we go along as well. I like to keep things as interactive as possible, though it's time is limited. So. Um, so the first thing about uh, academic integrity, it's what we all want in our assignments, okay, and assessments. So, um, and when we kind of had to do the COVID pivot last year, it kind of really sharpened the mind of what we want in terms of academic integrity. But I don't think we should kind of just park it there and say that was to do with that. I think we should kind of bring these with us as we go along. So obviously we want our exams to be valid. We want to assess the students to make sure they know the knowledge. But we have to be fair um, to honest students. So um, we want to make sure that that those who do things honestly and correctly and don't cheat um, kind of are, are, are looked after. OK, um, then we when in terms of an open book online, non vigilated exams, there's a lot of concern. So the academics are all worried about academic integrity. Will the students copy from another? Will they copy? Will they share their answers during the exam? Will they get the information from somewhere online? They're all worried about that. And we're all worried about the temptation for students. Okay, so when they're in an exam hall and invigilated, so invigilated means people walking up and down and checking that they're not cogging or copying from either. It's a lot easier to be able to check that they're doing what they're meant to be doing. Okay, so, um, so, one of the things when we had to do the pivot, we were moving from, um, you know, the, a lot of the exams that we generally have and the easiest things. So define, you know, rainy weather or define what an assessment is or define Bloom's taxonomy. It's really easy. So the students, they are kind of memorizing their definitions and we have no idea whether they actually understand the words that they're regurgitating. Right. So 
part of the, the move was to move from remembering the lower order of t Bloom's taxonomy from the knowledge and remembering <laughs> and comprehension understanding to apply it, analyze it. Okay, here's the framework for doing something. Now apply it and show us your understanding. Um, it can be harder to set exams because you have to think of more challenging questions. Um, and if the students have only been doing kind of regurgitation or memorizing stuff to date, it can be harder for them, okay? Um, but I would suggest that it's actually more authentic. So in the real world, so my um, world is, is programming. Um, and sometimes our programming exams are okay. You have access to nothing except, you know, a pen and paper and you have to write a computer program. Like there's no way in the real world that you'd be asked to do that. If you're asked to write a program, you will always have access online to kind of previous programs, sample bits of code, and you weave them in together to put to make things work. So I think um, moving to an open book exam is much more real world. Now, I do accept there are some subjects where it might be slightly trickier to do, but I, I, I do think it's kind of it is a, a step in the right direction. Um, so some other benefits of the, the digital uh, space is the students can use digital tools and it's what they normally use in their kind of their general semester. They're using things, they're typing up documents in some sort of word processor, they're using spreadsheets and all of a sudden in an exam situation, we don't want them to be using word processors. That seems mad to me, right? In the real world, especially in my domain, but I would argue in many domains, you are using technology as, as you go along. And I don't know about your students, but my students hardly ever write anything by hand. Sometimes even in a lecture, they're taking, you know, they're, they're typing on the computer and they're going, Drrr. they're not actually writing anything. And the other major advantage in terms of marking is you can actually read what they write. So sometimes it's kind of a guesstimate. Are they saying this? Um, so I just wanted to look at some, um, kind of we came up with a checklist for alternative online assessment. So um, we wanted to make sure that we were still checking the original learning outcomes um, because we didn't want to go off and assessing something that wasn't required or we didn't want to miss any of the learning outcomes. Um, we, we said that the, the new assessments had to have the same level of challenge as the original. So we couldn't make them way harder because they're open book and they'd all cheat or we couldn't make them way easier because that wouldn't we couldn't stand over assessment that way. Um, this was kind of a university-wide uh, list, not necessarily for the school computing students, but uh, we wanted to minimize the new computer and technical skills required in order to complete the work. So are we minimizing it? So um, for students who wouldn't have used a particular type of software, we suddenly didn't want them to have to use it as part of their exam. Okay. Um, so we want to help to mitigate the risks um, if the if the students couldn't submit to our online portal. Our online, our virtual learning environment is called Loop, which is just an instance of Moodle. So what would what we do if the students didn't have um, access to online um, the internet issues? Okay. Um, and then at, at a broad level, we needed to consider it for different modules. So there's different requirements if you have a technical module versus a non-technical module. So if I'm taking, testing the students programming skills versus their knowledge of the battle of X, Y, Z, and their out, the output of that, that's very different. Um, for some modules, you know, for modules that have worky out bits for mathematical modules or programming modules, you want the students to show their workings. So even if they end up with the wrong answer that you can actually see that they had the right process. And then some modules lend themselves to essay type answers. Again, not too much in the school of computing, but um, obviously a lot of kind of things in the humanities domain would have those. Then we also needed to take into account the different uh, stages of education so we could we have obviously different expectations of first years versus master students. Um, so we couldn't have, called, this is the one strategy that fits all. We had to be able to kind of cater for different learners. Okay, so the general approach we adopted was we wanted to ask probing questions. So the main thing was we wanted to see if they could apply the knowledge rather than could they remember it. So um, for example, what are the five steps in design thinking? So they would name, you know, whatever the, the, the five steps are. But now we assume that they have the five steps in a document in front of them. And we want to see, can they actually apply those five steps to a particular scenario? Okay. And I would argue that's much more real world than getting them to remember the five steps. Because if they're in a job, the, the manager isn't going to say, so without looking, tell me what the five steps are. Rather, okay, here's our scenario. 
go and apply the five steps and come back to me. Um, so we're assuming that the students will know and have access to their notes, so they will know in advance what's in the notes. So if they've studied and they've been involved all along, you know, that that's uh, fair, I think. And as I, just to emphasize, we're interested in how they apply their knowledge, not that they have it. OK, so we don't want this kind of memori memorization kind of regurgitation thing. So uh, there's kind of two types of questions. I'm just going to briefly touch on one type, um, which is the, you know, in, in my scenario, it would be software engineering type questions. So this idea is that you'd set up a scenario and you would ask the student problems. So uh, what approach would you recommend and why? So, for example, if Dublin Zoo want to um, design a new IT system, uh, what approach would you recommend and why? So I'm assuming they can look through their notes and they say there's three different approaches to doing it. And they could go with, we'll go with a, a prototype approach and then develop from that. Or we'll go with an agile approach or we'll go with a different type of approach, whatever applies in kind of software. And then say, how would they implement it? So everybody would come up, their answer to the second part would depend on the first part and their answer would be very different. So it's not something that you can kind of take out of a book. You have to be able to understand the different frameworks and apply them. Um, it was so for my colleagues in computing, um, you know, the habit would generally be to look at last year's questions, change a little bit, change the scenario a little bit, but more or less the wording would stay the same. So um, I came up with some kind of general questions for them to, as, to feed and to give them ideas. Like, so something like, what is the most important of effective? So they might know that there's three or four frameworks to do something. Um, so like if you think, if you take the battle of X, Y, Z, so what was the most important uh, strategy they adopted or which method was best when fighting in the desert or how would you design a whatever? What changes would you make kind of given a particular scenario? What other information that you need? You're given this information, why would you need to kind of further things along? And a nice kind of get out of jail one is, could you explain your reason to us? So I went for framework A. Why did you do that? I did it because it fitted the scenario or whatever. Um, and then another thing that uh, a lot of my colleagues found useful was smart quizzes. Okay, so on, uh, on Moodle and probably other VLEs as well, you can, have, um, you can have a bucket of questions. So say if you have 100 students, you don't want all 100 students to be getting the exact same questions. So you would have a bucket. So for example, I could have a bucket about a question about population. And I could have three questions there. What is the population of Albania, China, and Kenya? This is obviously a very bad example for an open book exam, but the idea is that you would have three different questions and the student would only get one of them at random. Okay. Um, again, for mathematical questions, you can have questions of similar difficulty, but each question, the student, when they see their exam paper, they're getting a slightly different question. Um, another important thing is to randomize the order of questions. So say if I have 20 questions on my paper, my question one is different from Orna's question one. OK, so my question one might be Orna's question 17, but because Orna is under time pressure and I am as well to answer my question, and my question one is China and hers is Albania, we kind of don't have time to kind of copy from with each other. OK, another important thing to do is um, feedback for students is great. But in a summative assessment, obviously, we don't want Orna to finish early and then to say, hey, Monica, these are the answers to the questions. So to make sure that you uh, postpone feedback until all the questions are finished. Um, so another colleagues wanted to have the kind of the option. They have a multiple choice question. And then you have to kind of flesh out the answer. So um, a question might be, what is the standard deviation for avocado production in Chile if the production values for the last X years are? So you'd show the students a piece of data and they would say, oh, it's whatever. And then you get the student to kind of do some sort of analysis piece. So it's combining the multiple choice with um, kind of a text piece, which is exploring their learning. Um, so you have to assume students have access to calculators and anything that's online, okay? Um, so the things that you can do is you can get them to fill out workings in a step-by-step -step approach. I'll show you an example in a minute. You can um, force sequencing. Um, so they can't answer question two until they've answered question one. And they can only submit it once. So if Orna and I have both answered question one, we can't go back and change our answers. It depends on how strict you want to be. And also you can enforce a time limit to make things strictier. So this is an example 
don't worry that it's kind of computing related, but what I have here, I have um, an equation that you have to solve. And the idea is I have all seven steps here, but the students have to decide which order you actually do them in. OK, so it gets around the problem of students doing something in a different order. I want them to clearly see this is step one, this is step two, this is step three. OK, I'm just showing some examples here. This is another example of a, um, so, you know, in things in computing are either one or zero. So in this scenario here, the student has to fill into each box, whether it's a one or a zero. OK, and each of these has a small amount of marks behind it. Um, this is another one here. So I want them to go through each of these different things. Don't worry what, what I'm doing there, but you can imagine some kind of mathematical calculation. And for each of these things, they have to fill in a piece of information. So it allows me to limit what they do in terms of making it yeah, easier to mark. Um, so just to kind of look back again at academic integrity, obviously it's a lot harder for non-invigilated exams. So if somebody's not watching over the student, it's harder to ensure that we are being kind of academically rigorous. Um, there is plagiarism detection software on most um, platforms. So Moodle has um, plugins that we use there to, to check for that. Um, and I think this is kind of harder for introductory level courses. So if you're asking students, if you ask them something like two plus two equals four, there's um, not so many different ways that they can actually do that calculation. And because they're introductory, there's not a lot you can ask them. And I think it's particularly challenging for programming and mathematical related courses. So the kind of the, the approach should be to um, design your questions smartly, making sure that you're checking for understanding rather than just kind of regurgitation of information. And you want to check the student's analysis of concepts. So you could have a, actually quite a big question and you know there might be subtle differences between the answers and then your answer multiple choice answers can be nearly you know the same but are kind of with subtle differences so just some tips to remember um, ask questions that ask students to apply their knowledge not just check their knowledge you could relate it to project work um, so say Orna did a project on kind of the botanic gardens and I did mine on the zoo. So Orna will only answer in botanic gardens and then I can't copy from her because her answers are different than mine. You can use different variants of the same question. Um, so some of my colleagues, with, there's a tool on, on Moodle where you can import questions and you can actually randomly generate the elements of the questions with a little bit of coding and smart stuff to so instead of you know one plus two seven plus nine or whatever so you can do different things there some of my colleagues who are using data sets so orna would get the data set for flowers i'd get the one for trees somebody else would get the one for fruits um so there's no point in me copying i actually we did detect some things unfortunately with students that orna gave the answers for flowers and she actually had the data for fruits so it didn't make sense at all and, you know, also always reserve the right to discuss with students after the exam and um, to, to check on their, uh, you know, if, if, you, if anything suspicious happens. I'm conscious of time, Lorna, so I'm just, it's my last slide, I think. So, um, so I would say overall we positive outcomes. So we encourage academics to kind of think outside the box in terms of how they assess students. Um, some of them got them to do videos. We had online meetings. We can use interactive orals. Um, just different ways of assessing the students instead of the normal kind of two-hour paper-based exam. It also encouraged academics to reconsider their assessment practices, and some of us won't go back to what we did before because what we have now is, is so much better, um, but some are dying to go back to what they had before. Um, and like in terms of the digital transformation in education, you know, sometimes we had to drag people kicking and screaming to use our VLE and now they're all on board and they're doing assessment stuff that they dream, never dreamed they would use in, in a million years. So I think that's it. Yeah. And so I will uh, stop sharing. Thank you very much, Monica. Very interesting. Uh, I, I think the, the use of quizzes is very, very interesting. We have a few questions, two questions for you. Okay. before we move on to the next speaker okay. um so the first there from cesar i'd like to know your approach on the impersonating problem especially with second chance or extraordinary tests where some students have already passed and could be helping or even doing the exam of their colleague that has failed the first attempt okay. so that's the first one okay I'll, I'll take that first so so in in our university all the students have to sit the the test on whatever day it is um and if they don't make that um, they have a chance to reset the exam um, in August. 
so that we don't have a scenario where Orna does the test today and I have a sniffle and I said, oh, I can't possibly do it today. I'll do it tomorrow. We, we don't have a facility to do that. Um, we did put kind of extra things in place if the student had extenuating circumstances, particularly in the, you know, in the March to May last year when students had connectivity problems and whatever. But in general, we, we don't have that scenario. Um, so that's kind of interesting that you have that there, Cesar. And one more, which, uh, which are the reasons to force sequential quiz navigation? Presential exams are able to switch as they like. Okay, so I'm not too familiar with the term presential exams. Me, but, me neither. Okay, so um, so in some in some subjects, okay, some colleagues did this either for questions or some of them had um, a question, and then you could you could only move on to the next question once you finished question one. Or some of them did it for sections. So I have all my MCQs questions first, and then once you finish the MCQ, you move on to the more um, kind of text-based answers, but you can't go back and change your MCQs. Okay, so, so there's, there's an integrity kind of reason. Yeah, yeah, it's for yeah. integrity reasons. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I think uh, that's very good. Thank you, Monica. Um, we'll yeah. take more questions at the end, but thank you very much. Uh, and we're going to move on now to our next speaker, which is Professor Stylianos Hatsapangos, apologies for butchering your name. Uh, Stylianos uh, works at the University of London Centre for Distance Education, where he's a fellow and executive co-lead for research and dissemination. His expertise is in technology enhanced learning, research informed innovation of academic practice and doctoral and postgraduate education management. His research and scholarship includes learning design, evaluation of online learning environments, formative and technology enhanced assessment, computer supportive collaborative work, digital literacy, social media, social networks in an educational context. Wow, that's a lot of research areas. And he's co-presenting with his colleague, Dr. Linda Amrain Cooper, who I'll also introduce. Linda is head of the University of London's Centre for Distance Education. She leads a team that supports the development of expertise in the field of distance education providing a focus for the development of high quality teaching and research in open and distance learning. Linda is also in the senior leadership team as director of strategic projects uh, and leads uh, the PG learning and teaching HE program at UOL. So welcome to both of you and I'll hand over to you. Thank you, thank you, Anna. Linda is sharing his screen. Okay, right. Hello, everybody. Linda and I will share this slide presentation. So, uh, from the title, you must have understood that we are going to talk about this move into online assessment uh, uh, evaluation at the University of London. Just to start with the overall context, and I think this will give you a, a, a good idea about uh, what we will be talking about in. Um, uh, Late March 2020, the university communicated to all uh, the students that the examinations in 2020 will have to move online uh, because conven conventional examinations, which would uh, normally take at exam centers around the world, uh, would not be possible due to the pandemic. Uh, so 38,000 students from the University of London uh, uh, distant learners were registered to take over 100,000 exams in uh, uh, in the summer across 23 time zones. So that's the kind of evaluation we are going to talk about. Linda, can you please move to the next slide? So uh, br very briefly, very, very briefly, the structure of the talk, uh, we are going to talk about the purpose of the study, uh, some theoretical background, uh, then Linda is going to talk about the methodology of the student voice. I will, I will touch on the examiner's feedback and the program director views. And Linda will talk about uh, some measures, some resources to support students to succeed in the next round of assessment 2021. And she will talk about the conclusions as well. So the purpose of the evaluation was to provide a very detailed evaluation of what happened last summer with this move to online assessment. Uh, to identify the experience of the key stakeholders 
stakeholder groups and also to identify implications for the future of digital assessment at the University of London. And finally, very, very important, it had to do with lessons, lessons learned to support the preparation for the summer 2021 assessment. Right. Uh, so what I'm going to talk, talk about here is some, uh, I will summarize some of the key outcomes of, of the theoretical investigation we engaged with when we started this project. Uh, I'm glad that Monica uh, covered some of this stuff in relation to uh, academic, academic integrity, for instance. So uh, the research we looked at had to do with research which was pre-pandemic, but interestingly, they were very, very fast because there was a frenetic pace of people, of academics moving their programs online, but also a uh, lot of uh, debates and, and discussions and depth explorations of what this meant for, uh, for pedagogy. So uh, the recent debates on assessment in, uh, in higher education, in the higher education sector, revolve around changes and uncertainty of the future. Uh, this investigated mainly whether 2020 marked the beginning uh, of the end for impassioned fixed time paper-based assessment. Uh, so quite a lot of debate was around this area, how, uh, how permanent would be these changes, this transition to online learning, or as Monica mentioned, some of these uh, academics when the, the uh, unprecedented circumstances of the pandemic uh, were over, whether they would move back to what they were doing. Uh, for instance, uh, exam, uh, paper-based exams for their students. Uh, recent research has also explored the relationship between the students' performance and their preferences when they use online and offline assessments, and how to improve digital assessment practice a student motivation and engagement. Overall, uh, and previous research, not um, exactly uh, research that has taken place during this pandemic, but previous research uh, identified that students uh, were comfortable with, uh, with online assessment. They like online assessment. They like the timeliness of the feedback they might be able to receive with online assessment. Um, they find it quite convenient as well, sometimes uh, because of cost, sometimes of issues of accessibility. Um, the other kind of aspect that's very important there is uh, that the shift to online assessment and employing online invigilation, uh, and sometimes uh, what we call proctoring system, has generated, as Monica mentioned, quite a few debates on academic integrity. So. In this respect, there, are, there seem to be two dominant, dominant threats in such debates, which are far from complementary. What I mean by that is uh, there is one threat that involves promoting creative design of authentic assessment. The emphasis here is on authentic and clear guidelines to students about expectations around referencing and plagiarism in order to avoid plagiarism. The other threat, uh, is more techy, if I can use this expression, provides technological and practical safeguards to protect academic integrity, such as moderation of marking, text matching software, and the use of other mechanisms, for instance, vivas to verify student academic work. Uh, so there is an overall issue about uh, equity uh, of access, also. Uh, some academics talk about, uh, some researchers talk about an overall drop in assessment, uh, uh, sorry, an overall drop in achievement where students move to online assessment, but there's no definitive kind of outcome or agreement in, in uh, public research about that. Um, and also there is, uh, as, we, as I just mentioned, this overall kind of debate about assessment offenses and uh, how uh, 
you can manage academic integrity, how you can create awareness of plagiarism issues to the students in order to uh, avoid these academic offenses, very serious issue. Uh, the other kind of thing I need to mention is uh, uh, that uh, we had uh, in these uh, uh, exams that the students uh, were asked to take, these online exams, uh, there were three exam formats, uh, and that was very important because it had to do with the window of submission. Uh, there was a short submission period of up to five hours or a medium submission period, which uh, could be from five to 48 hours. And finally, there was a much wider uh, submission window uh, identifying resulting in a long submission period of up to seven days. Uh, over to you, Linda. Thanks, Deliano. So, so just to go back to the, so the University of London has 50,000 students who are studying online and distance with us and about 35 to 38,000 were due to take exams last May through June. Um, and uh, so obviously we had to move those all online. Um, they would normally have taken pen and paper exams in exam centres local to where they live and they're in, located in about 190 countries. So it was obviously going to be a really big change. Um, so the evaluation that we undertook then uh, really considered these sort of four pillars uh, that, are, that are on your screen here. So student behaviour. So we were looking at how did student behave? How did they behave? Did they do their exam? Which was one of the important questions about whether we were providing that opportunity. How did they engage with the virtual learning environment where they were, were going to get their exams from? We had some programs that were going to use um, a separate platform with a proctoring process on that. Um, that was not successful in the sense that, um, I'll just detail that while we're here, in the, that um, students in different locations where they had less established bandwidth were not able to uh, interact with the uh, system effectively. And it wasn't as, as well developed as, uh, as, as we thought it was going to be. So we pulled out a proctoring entirely. <clears throat> um, and there was also questions about how do students submit the answers? And, and I know that there's already been some discussion of that. So there was that student behaviour section that we were looking at. There was, was student sentiment. So we sent a survey to students out to that 35, 38,000 student body um, two weeks after their, their set of exams finished. So before their marks were confirmed, we also undertook uh, interviews and we had student research fellows working with us on the project as part of the interviewing team. Um, we considered student outcomes and that question of uh, grade changes, were they higher average marks or lower average marks? And we were very keen to know whether we disadvantaged our students badly. Could they not do the exam and, and did they do less well than they should have done uh, in this process? And we look back over four years and consider distribution of awards as well as individual module marks or units of study marks. <clears throat> and then we did a, a deep dive into the operational issues, which surfaced some of the discussion that's already gone on about um, assessment offences, integrity, um, and the choices that were made by the programme teams. So we were looking at it, uh, 100, about 100,000 exams across about 120 different academic pathways and programmes. So a huge variety there, computing, English, philosophy, uh, law, um, undergraduate and postgraduate, so a really big variety of programmes there. We were also able to uh, look at um, factors including location with students, in, as I said, in 190 countries, programme, gender, age, special exam arrangements um, and exam type. So just a brief bit about, oops, sorry, about the uh, responses. We got about eight and a half thousand responses <clears throat> from the, the, the body that we sent out the survey to. So this is the student body now responding. Uh, a pretty even distribution of genders. You'll see ages fairly well distributed in relation to the our um, demographic pattern, which is that we have slightly older students than 
than on campus type provision, study level, undergraduate, postgraduate, um, mode of study, teaching centre and independent. So we have two models of student experience. Students can either study entirely online, working through the VLE, um, or they can attend a local recognised teaching centre um, that's part of our, our provision. Um, so it was evenly split with students responding on those. And then also we were able to get feedback from students who were taking those shorter exams, which where the submission was between one hour and five hours. Um, and that varied by paper. It was the same for everybody taking the same paper, but it was different in different modules. And then the medium exams, which were up to 48 hours. And then we had a, just one program uh, with a small cohort that, that did the seven day um, return. So I can't go into all of the details now, and as you can imagine, there was a lot there, but I think it's uh, what I've done here is trying to summarize um, the impact on our students. So the first thing is that 93% of exam events took place. So that was 93% of the exams that we thought were going to happen, that students were booked in for took place. That's actually higher than our normal level. It's usually around 89%. So more students did more of their exams. Um, in terms of locations, students in all locations engaged with exams. That's not to say that every single student was able to engage with their exams. Of course, there were some uh, circumstance issues, uh, but overall, there were no countries or locations where, where nobody could get to their exam. In the feedback, 79% of them agreed that they were able to demonstrate their learning through the online assessment, which we felt was a pretty good outcome. Given, uh, you know, thinking back to what it was like in March when we were setting up these exams and we we're all working from, <laughs> you know, our, our kitchen table, et cetera, as well as our students were as well. Um, some students were not fully equipped to engage with the format and the requirements of their, their exams. So there were implications for training that we'll pick up a bit later on. But some of the things there were, if they had a 24 or 48 hour exam, what did that actually mean in terms of how much time they spent on that exam? And some students found that was quite stressful. So if they thought they had 48 hours, they felt they needed to be working on the exam for 48 hours. Um, it also meant that things like word counts were quite important because if somebody's working on a response for 48 hours, they can write an awful lot of words. So we needed to be careful about word counts. Um, in communications, you know, there were opportunities for us to have enhanced communication. I mean, you know, we we were really kind of not even swans because we were with 100,000 exams to deliver very quickly uh, in a massive change like this. There was some, uh, you know, improvement that we could make. Um, we did move the exams back a bit in the time, so they didn't start exactly when they were due to start. We moved them back a bit. That did have some negative impact on students who might have jobs or family commitments who they had to make some rearrangements. Um, assessment offences, we had a higher number of assessment offences referred for consideration um, and uh, that then kind of bogged the system down a bit. So it meant that we were later, we'd moved the exams, we then had more uh, exam offences, which meant the marks couldn't be released quite as quickly as normal. So it did have a sort of a knock-on effect into this academic year. Um, so that's, that's the sort of impact on students. So overall, they could do their exams. They felt they were able to continue with their exams. Much of the open text comment was very... Uh, positive about the experience, how relieved they were to be able to do the exams, how much they appreciated having the opportunity to do their exams given the circumstances, that some of the stress was gone, the stress of having to go into an exam centre, you know, with the COVID conditions, but also the usual stress of having to go into exam centres, but also some feedback to suggest that it was difficult to find a space, broadband was an issue, um, you know, those kind of things bearing in mind that all of our students were online students, so they all had to have computers and some sort of connection in. That's a sort of an entry requirement for us. So it did reduce some of those digital inequalities for our student cohort. Um, I'm going to pass on to Stylianos, who's going to pick up on the results of the examiner survey. And just, I think, Stylianos, you're just reporting on, on one or two findings there, aren't you? <clears throat> Stylianos, are you able to come back in? 
You might be on mute. Uh, yeah, I was I was muted. <laughs> Thanks, Linda. <laughs> okay, <laughs> as usual, uh, very common. Uh, right. Uh, so um, I will pick only on a couple of uh, very important issues from the exams, uh, examiner survey that have to do with uh, have a direct impact on the student uh, aspect of the evaluation. So uh, the, the slide you are, you are looking at uh, was question four of the survey, which asked them uh, to how this move to online assessment has affected the student performance. And very interestingly, a very positive, the examiners had said that uh, students have been able to achieve higher academic standards in the submitted work than the previous years, which I think was very positive, a very encouraging uh, outcome for this kind of evaluation. Uh, so the examiners were more positive about the transition rather than negative. Uh, there were some other uh, issues that were very important there as well. Um, for instance, students in the context of the paper-based exams that Linda was talking about were submitting paper uh, and handwritten exams, whereas now all the exams were online. Uh, so in typed exams, the legibility was much appreciated by the examiners. Uh, the other kind of uh, body of uh, uh, stakeholders, group of stakeholders we are go I'm going to look at very briefly is the program director's views. And then uh, very important because the program directors are the, the uh, belong to the program teams uh, or lead the program teams that uh, set the exams. Monica talked about quite a lot about this, uh, the format of the exams was very interesting for, for, for me to hear. Um, so in terms of the program director's views, uh, there was a range of views on online assessment for, uh, for the future about the planned transformation of assessment, which has been accelerated by this uh, pandemic. A very important kind of outcome, I think, from the evaluation that uh, for uh, 2020, exams remain the predominant assessment format uh, rather than moving to alternative formats of assessment, for instance, coursework, which happened in, uh, uh, in a, quite a few programs, but uh, overall exams remain the predominant assessment format. The reasons the uh, program directors used for that was that the, the perceived academic rigor of the assessment process, the recognition of the exams by professional bodies, regional regulators, and uh, the impact and radical change might have on the confidence in the quality of degrees. In terms of pedagogy, it was very important to mention that there was some rethinking of the end of module assessment pedagogy. So uh, it, in quite a few of the program directors that you talked uh, uh, with, there was this adoption of alternative forms, uh, for instance, coursework to complement or to replace the exam. Um, Overall, quite a lot of, uh, uh, of good ideas there in these interviews about this shift from viewing the exams as the mainly, as mainly a measurement of learning to seeing the potential of these exams by transforming the content of exam as, uh, and uh, uh, discussing the potential of this for assessment for learning. Um, so the exam content for 2021 would move to open book exams and uh, there was a, in that uh, dilemma I talked about in the, the research, there was a emphasis on redesigning assessment rather than implementing huge, stacky infrastructure that uh, would monitor students. Over to you, Linda. You're on mute, Linda. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, University of London haven't got the hang of this at all. Right. So um, definitely um, some, some real changes, I think, from, from that emergency 2020 move online to now preparing for this summer's on, online assessment. So our, our, you know, about again, about 35,000 students, about 100,000 exams. They started uh, yesterday, um, about 7,000 students assessed in, in, in the last couple of days now so we're, we're moving forward with that and we we 
we spent a lot of time thinking about the findings from the evaluation and what it meant for planning for this summer. And so these are the sort of things that we needed to uh, to work at. So communication and, and, you know, having some plans around that, FAQs, lots of webinars, you know, really clear signposting and paperwork, well-being, student well-being, that was really, really significant. And that's not just around the old question of assessment, it's around the question of uh, living in a time of, of, of pandemic, I guess, you know, and we're all dealing with these issues of, of student well-being and supporting them, but also motivation and peer-to-peer -peer interactions and the way in which peers can work with, with each other. So that we've developed quite a lot in there. Um, uh, going back to that student behaviour, and I was talking about, you know, students not necessarily knowing what you do with a 48 hour exam, for example. So starting to, to support students at, um, and our colleagues to explore how do you behave? You know, we're used to going into an exam centre and knowing you've got to put your bag at the side and you can't have your phone and you can't have written anything up your arm, all of that. Most people have had that experience growing up as a child going into unseen written exams. But, uh, you know, now we need to develop all the sort of behaviours that go around an exam, um, as well as obviously it responding effectively to it. Enhancing technology, making sure that our VLEs weren't going to crash, that the systems were well signposted, those, those were important things. Changes to our general regulations, really troubleshooting around the areas of academic integrity and assessment offences was very important. Um, and, and very importantly as well is understanding uh, the special, those students who would normally have special exam arrangements um, and how assistive technology uh, can work there. And we, we did a, quite a detailed study, which I haven't got time to talk about really, but looked at our, our large, uh, relatively large group of students who would normally have special exam arrangements and understanding what needed to be different for them. So I'm just going to stop there really to say um, this is the sort of resource that we produce. So the students on the on the student portal have um, quizzes that they can. So these are not assessed quizzes. These are quizzes and resources and materials um, that help them to prepare for exams. So that you can't see it really here, but there's study tips and, and looking after yourself during the assessment period. Um, there's a... a, a a, a big piece on plagiarism and the rule for online timed assessments, you know, what we expect around citations, given that we're talking about open book uh, exams, which I, I think picks up with much of what's already been discussed today. So in conclusion, then, we did it. Us and our students did their assessments and, and they were able to demonstrate their learning. And overall, there was a, a bit of an increase in, in average academic outcomes for our students. So they weren't disadvantaged unnecessarily globally uh, there. Um, uh, exam delivery parameters continue to vary to support different types of engagement and different types of student and different types of location and different types of subject discipline and within subjects. Um, the crisis has definitely accelerated the change and fostered a rethinking of assessment pedagogy, um, you know, to the point where we're all exhausted, I suspect. Um, definitely spending time talking about designing for training, understanding academic integrity issues are, are very important in this world of digital assessment. And then to some extent, going back to redesigning our modules and our qualifications, going right back to that start of what are the learning outcomes that we're asking students to demonstrate through their constructively aligned uh, assignments. So it's um it's an exciting time. It's um also you know, like everywhere, quite a challenging time with such large scale. The references are in the slides, and I presume everybody will get the slides. So um, we'll stop there. Thank you very much, Linda and Silianos. The scale is staggering. That really stands out to me. Um, because I yeah, we felt a I bit staggered as well. <laughs> I, I come from a similar background, but I don't have that many students. Uh, but but actually, we had similar problems, though. Uh, so, so very interesting. And thank you for sharing your experience. There's a few questions that we might actually leave till, till the end, if that's OK. And I might introduce uh, the next speaker, which is Inez. 
Uh, so Dr. Inez gil Harena, and apologies, Inez, if I'm br- brutalizing your name. My Spanish pronunciation is also rubbish. And so Inez is an Eden Fellow and a member of the Eden uh, NAP Committee. She's an Associate Professor at the Faculty of Education at UNED in Spain. She coordinates the CoLab Teaching Innovation Group at, her, at, at UNED, and her research in open and distance education includes assessment and curriculum design. Over to you, Inez. Thank you, Orna, and thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm, I'm glad to see how, uh, despite we are in different places, um, we are coming to the similar solutions and, and concerns. I, I will show you because I will present some, uh, well, some, some information from a study we have undertaken at UNED, um, which is quite has some similarities with the one from the University of London Center for Distance Education, and also some of the guidelines uh, my university has said are common to the ones that Monica Ward said at the beginning. Um, well, the study I am going to present is not an institutional study, but it's undertaken by by some uh, faculty professors from my my research group, and one of them is also uh, attending the sem- the webinar, Daniel Dominguez. And our our concern at the beginning was to see what had happened in our course. We did a course together in the second semester, and what had happened in our course when we had to change the assessment method last year very rapidly due to the lockdown and all the pandemic situation. But then we we decided to extend the study to all the the university in the bachelor degrees. Um, so what, what happened last year? Uh, well, first, my university, UNED, is, the, is a distance education university and is a, the largest university in Spain with, uh, last year, more than 125,000 students registered, more of, most of, the, of them part-time students. And the demographics are similar to those that the previous presenters shown about their institution, very diverse uh, population, different ages, different uh, background, etc. cetera. Um, and the university had their first 28 bachelor degrees, and this will be the, this is the focus of our study. Um, and the focus is also on the final examination, which is uh, the biggest part of the final score for our, st- our students. There is also some continuous assessment and some assignments in the courses, but the, f- the final exam is very relevant for their, uh, the decision if they pass or not the course. Um, mm, commonly, um, before and after the pandemic, the characteristic of, of the final exams is, is that it's a it's course, it's the faculty teams, they decide the type of exam. So there are there are very diverse type of exams and with different durations, less than two hours, between one and two hours commonly, and that all the examinations take place at the same time in the same course. So they are synchronous in before in all the regional centers face to face and now uh, since uh, June 2020 in the online examination platform. And in this uh, slide, you can see the differences between the final examination until February 2020 and in June 2020. And the focus of our study is in, in that semester, in that first time that the university used the online assessment platform for the final examinations. After that, we have been using it uh, also in September last year. In February, we will use it in June this year and also in September. So we didn't really uh, know how long it will la- the pandemic would last, but we are in a similar situation now, so we will be still using it. And there are not face-to-face exams as they were before um, currently. So the characteristics uh, before in the face-to-face exams were uh, that they were taking place in different locations in Spain and also in uh, other other places in Europe and Latin America mainly. Normally, the examinations were without material and there were different uh, control measures. Uh, Well, the students have to identify themselves before going into the classroom and they were invigilated exams 
there were faculty supervising all the, the classroom and the examination process. And also the students were distributed in the classroom. So in a specific order. So there were not two students from the same course seated uh, close to each other. So they were distributed in the classroom. And what happened in June 2020? Well, in, in a very short period of time since March, the university has had to set up a new uh, system because it was not possible to have the face-to-face -face exam. Some, some of the centers have very big uh, amount of students uh, exam, doing the exam uh, at the same time, so it was not possible. So the university said in um, our own platform, it's called AVEX, which is Aula Virtual de Examines, examination classroom, uh, virtual examination classroom, um some in some courses now um, in that call and also now materials were allowed so they were more open book examinations but not in all cases so most or most of the courses still had no material allowed during the exam and there were different control measures in the platform one was the identification well the students had, had to enter with their own password and also um as some as the um, other presenters said in their in their universities as well, the exam the exam the different exams uh, had different questions like random questions selected from a bucket of, of uh, or from a pool of, of questions. Also, there there is a camera shots during the exam to the students to check if they are. Uh, this is for identification and also the anti-plagiarism check and software to compare the students' responses to the to the exams. Um, in this in, in this context, our interest was to see if there was any impact on the students' performance when the examination changed to online, and also what were the students' perceptions about the process. So about the uh, academic performance indicators, we have used the information from the UNED Data Management Office and we have processed it. And this is an, a summary for all the degrees. And you can see that all the rates were quite stable, but they all went up in last, last year, in, in June, 2020. And let, let's see them a bit uh, more carefully. The first rate, and which is, in my opinion, the most important, also because we are a distance education university where the assessment rate is not as high as in face-to-face -face universities. Um, this, this rate, which is the relation between the students who were enrolled and those who, who took the exam, the students who were really assessed, increase in all the degrees, in the 28 degrees. And this is very relevant because it, it, uh, we can uh, estimate that if a student uh, complete the course and are assessed, this would increase their engagement and they will register the coming year, which can solve a problem or a concern in distance education, which is the dropout rate and retention rates. And in the specific degree that I coordinate, the degree in social education, you can see that also the assessment rate increased in last, last year. The second rate is the success rate, which is the relation between the students who go to the final exam and those who pass the exam. And it also increased in all the cases. So this is a... The, the increase is not as big as in the assessment rate, but it is also a positive. Uh, the success rate increased in, in that call when the online assessment was just for the first time. Um, and this is the case in the um, social education degree. You see, it is a higher rate, but the increase is not as high as in the assessment rate. And the, the next rate is the achievement rate, which is the relation between, between the students enrolled originally and the students who pass the course. And here also, uh, and consequently, because this is related to the two previous rates, this also increased. 
um, in, in all the degrees. You can see this, is, this represents the increase between the, the, rate, the average rate in the previous years and the average in, in June 2020. And this is the, the achievement rate increase in, in the degree of social education. And finally, the average mark, which is the final score the students had in the, in the courses. And this also increased. And in some uh, degrees, the, the increase were very low. And in, in the others was more than one point. The, the score is from zero to 10. And the students have to have a minimum of five points to pass the course. So the increase is in, in some of the degrees is 0 0.14, which is very low increase, but in others is more than one, one zero five in the highest different. Okay. And in social education, the increase was not so high. So what, what does this say about the, the student's performance? And to me, the most significant is that mo more students took the final exam than in previous years. And this was significantly higher with the relation with engagement that I mentioned before. And uh, consequently, the achievement rate increased. Those who passed from those among those enrolled but the average mark, so the final score, increased, but not so much. And this is some of the points that can uh, is leading to debate nowadays. And it has to do with the academic integrity that we, we will talk about later. And to complement this, uh, this study of the, of the academic performance, which is based on the data from all the courses, we, we, um, we took or we prepared the survey in, in June 2020. Uh, originally, it was going to be a survey only for our students in our course or in our degree, but we made it, we made it extensive to all the, all the university. And we got replies from 714 students from 20 of the 28 bachelor degrees. Most of them are from the social science area, I have to say. And I have chosen some of the questions we made, not, not all the questions in the survey, but what, one question we had is uh, if the fact of the exams being online had influenced their decisions to, to take the exam or not. And to our surprise, most of them said it, it had no influence. So they were going to, uh, they, they took the exam uh, in any case. They, they were going to uh, be assessed despite the type of exam. For some of them, maybe more of 10%, it, it discouraged them to take the exam because it was online. And for some of them, it encouraged them. We, we, we will see later some reasons they, they said for this. Another question we had is uh, if they thought that the online exams were easier than the face-to-face -face ones. And here, a majorities were, did not agree. They didn't think that online exam, the online exams were easier. Um, we can contrast it, this with the, with the performance, with the average score, which we have seen it was higher, but still they, they didn't think that it was easier to have the examination online. And finally, we asked for their preference. And a majority, but not a so big majority, a bit more than half percent, they prefer the online exams. And still 40% uh, of the students that reply to the, to the survey prefer the face-to-face -face exams. And in the open-ended question of the survey, um, they, they expressed some of the problems they had experienced. And the main mentioned problem was uh, the time, the duration of the exam. Then they thought it was not enough and for different reasons. So in some, uh, some um, faculty, they decided to reduce a lot the duration of the exam and they said it was not enough or they had some issues with uh, writing in the computer if they had to write some uh, open-ended questions and so the time was, was a big concern and also the anxiety uh, 
but mainly beforehand, because it was the first time they were experiencing this, this online system and they had a lot of worries before. If the connection would fail, if they had problems with the software or with any technical aspect. So it was more anxiety before doing the exam, because afterwards, the main opinions were that it, it went well, the platform was easy to use. So uh, regarding the preferences, um, for those who prefer the online exam, a very big reason was the mobility. Like they didn't have to, to travel to the regional center. Uh, if they had mobility issues, uh, mobility problems, it was easier to take the exam from wherever they were, family conciliation. So these were some reasons they, they expressed for preferring the online exams. And for preferring the face-to-face -face, face exams, uh, the thing is that the replies they gave to the survey, they were not relate, related to preferring face-to-face -face exams for themselves, but because they had had problems with the online exam in that same in that first call in June 2020, like bad experience, because they thought they think uh, they thought the the time was not enough. They had problems with the internet, or they didn't have a proper place to to take the, the exam quietly, and they prefer the exam classroom in the regional center. Um, and also, a minority of the students were claiming for a more diverse uh, assessment type not only the final exam, um, like having more assignments during the semester, etc. So having this information, uh, what are currently the faculty concerns? Uh, and this is very common to what the previous presenters have said. The main one and is in, in the debate uh, every day is about the academic integrity or plagiarism. Uh, we don't have really information about the number of cases of plagiarism that has been detected and effectively, um, not, it's not just a suspicion, but confirmed plagiarism. But those cases that have happened uh, have been, have made a lot of noise, like um, especially people sharing exams or having a, um, like WhatsApp group sharing the, the examination, make, making the exams in group together, not individually. So this is a, the main concern. And the other one is the workload. Uh, first, in, in designing uh, exams that are more appropriate to avoid plagiarism and, um, and to have a more authentic assessment, and also the workload in marking. Because as the assessment rate increased, uh, all the faculty will have more exam exams to mark at the end of the semester. So it's a, the workload was really high last, last year in the, during the pandemic. And the university has sent to all the faculty some guidelines for how to design the exams. And these are common to what the previous presenters have said. They are recommending the open textbooks, uh, open book exams, to increase the, the bucket of, of uh, questions for have for run, have random randomization, to avoid these uh, very um, basic in the Bloom taxonomy questions for just remember, etc., uh, literal, and to adjust the duration of the exam. So the, stu the students can focus on their exam and they don't have time to share with others or to do some uh, uh, misbehaviors. Um, so now the question is what will happen? Um, and some faculty, I don't know, we are seeing this as an opportunity to redesign all the overall assessment process uh, and to try to rethink the role of the final examination, which we still have need to have. This is a requirement from the ministry. We would need to do a lot of uh, things to to to, uh, to remove the exam, the final exam. Um, and also, we have to be to be in mind the number of students we have. For instance, in, in my course, I have nine hundred students, so it's very difficult to to have a very um, formative and continuous assessment with nine hundred students. 
but we still have the opportunity to rethink the overall assessment process and to think on using diverse assessment methods. And the big question uh, is if uh, we will go back to the face-to-face -face exams uh, as soon as the pandemic uh, uh, allows it, or it will be combining the online exams and the face-to-face, the -face or what will happen? And we don't have the answer to that yet. Um, well, thank you very much for, for your attention. Thanks, Inez. Very interesting stuff. I see, I see you had the COVID bounce which is what we were calling at last June, that, that all the marks seemed a little higher. Um, but what's one thing that is very interesting about all three presentations was the similarities in, in experience and approach and really, really quite similar. So we might just, uh, we're, 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 we're a bit over time, but we, we'll just keep going. Um, we might just take a few wee questions, if that's all right. There's a few there in the chat. Um, I see Monica's jumping in there answering one about students with disabilities. I think Stylianus and Linda, you had some particular approaches around dealing with students with disabilities. Do you want to briefly answer on that? Or sure, on yes, I mean, absolutely. So students who would, uh, you know, we have a variety of different arrangements that are made for, for students depending on their particular needs. So uh, extended time. Uh, so, you know, we, we just applied that as well. So they would have more time if they if they needed it. Um, but students, for example, who might um, have previously had somebody who did the writing for them a scribe, um, that was much more challenging, not, not in terms of our system, but because of COVID, because they could, probably couldn't have a scribe with them. So one of the things that we're looking into in quite a lot of detail at the moment is the use of speech to text software to support students there and alternatively text to speech software. Um, and, and one of the things we've identified is that not all students know how to use what are quite common tools on on. on but most of our computers now. So actually for all students, we, we're, we've produced a little teaching aid to help them understand how they can use that. Um, the other thing was, uh, you know, where students might have had um, somebody who read the exam papers, you know, uh, to them and so on, that we were able to facilitate because we could use Zoom or phone calls and so on to, to, to help that uh, happen. But, and what, and then, a number of students who would normally have had uh, difficulty, you know, physical difficulty, maybe getting into an exam room or traveling to the exam center and so on. Actually, their feedback was that this was really liberating and they never wanted to go back <laughs> to exam centers and, and, and pen, pen and paper. Um, but definitely, you know, a really wide variety of different needs. Um, and some of them were had better experiences with the online assessment and some had worse experiences. But of course, uh, underpinning all of this was the fact that students were themselves getting COVID or their family members were getting COVID. So we were dealing all the time with, you know, uh, and of course the staff were as well, particularly as our staff you know, with our teaching centres are around the world at different points, different people were, were getting sick. So um, it's, you know, it's been a kind of an ongoing <laughs> Roller coaster of discovery, I think, is one way of describing it. <laughs> Thanks, Linda. And I see Monica was typing away very actually similar how, how, how students were handling it in DCU. And actually, that was a great uh, point there, Monica, about students using their own laptops, which are set up with their different assistive technologies. And because I think before, did we used to make them use borrowed ones or something? Yeah, well, no, I mean, you pre COVID, they'd have to go into a, a lab. Yeah. where they'd have the software installed but it was so clunky like they were all sitting in a desktop and they'd have to cop they'd have to copy it onto a um a, i can't even remember was it cd rom or something it was something ridiculous like i mean especially for computing students like that's neandro um and then i think we might have moved to um usb and i don't know more recently we might have been getting kind of emailed or put up somewhere in the system or whatever but mm -hmm. um so i because uh, i i'm conscious like of the, the disability students like we have a colleague who's completely blind so he'd be would be you know forefront to the front of our minds on that um uh, i don't know if students are hard of hearing um I, I think for some students with disabilities the fact that they could be on their own in their own environment using the their own setup of however they they learned i think that was 
actually quite liberating for them. Mm-hmm. We would have quite a few students um, on the autistic spectrum, um, you know, especially in computing. Um, so some of them would have sort of, you know, anxiety and, and stuff like that. So they'd have to be in a room on their own. And um, I think the fact that they were at home or whatever it was was great. I mean, having said that, I mean, I know students who were really worried, like they'd only one laptop. They had another sister doing an exam. Their parents needed it for work. Some of them mm-hmm. had to mind their older sister looking after granny. Um, so it, it wasn't all sweetness and light. It definitely. Um, yeah. That was the same for our, our students. We, we asked them those questions in the evaluation and we got a lot of open tech res- text responses on that. Um, you know, the challenge of of having a room of your own to in order to do the exam and, and not having other people kind of coming in, not having noise and, and all of that was was a challenge. Uh, and broadband was a significant challenge. Yeah. Um, students, for example, some of our students in Bangladesh had real problems with with having sufficient broadband and then um, with having many of them having to use their phone to tether um, and then, yeah. you know, the costs of that, etc. Yeah. So so there, there were yeah. were many challenges. Um, yeah, we, we had students in India as well, and they were mm-hmm. saying our, our, we've lost Internet in our region for the next four hours mm, what are we going yeah, to do yeah. and that that timing of the exam was also challenging mm. I mean, yours was larger scale than ours but we, we would have students in kind of vancouver over to india and, and whatever and just finding a time so some students are saying well i had to get up at two o'clock in the morning to do the exam and you know the, you can't you can't please everybody that was one of the reasons why we used the 24 hour and 48 yeah. hour window with people having, for some of the exams, once you clicked on the exam, you then had three hours or two hours or whatever. Yeah, you yes. could click on it any time in that 24-hour window. Um, yeah. It was your, it was up to you to yeah. work for a time that worked for you. So that was okay. But that then does present the opportunity for students to screencast what's on their exam paper and send it down the road to somebody else. So, you know, all of those uh, issues kind of relate back to these integrity questions but the work that you did Monica around designing exams where it's application and really using higher order skills are exactly what's so important I think as we move forward. Yeah. And you also actually said something um, very important about the exam so just because it's a 24 hour exam doesn't mean they have to work 24 hours on it mm. that you're mm. expecting you know a report or a case study or mm. Um, whatever. So I gave my students um, uh, an eight-hour exam. Um, and, you know, so they, they knew what was going to be on it. I was going to ask them about design thinking, and I was going to ask about some business model canvas or whatever, but they didn't know the context it was going to be applied to. And, mm-hmm. you know, if, if you copied the same thing as Orna, and you stood in the, all, it was about Dublin Zoo, but you all started talking about rhinoceroses instead of picking birds or, you know, African mm-hmm. animals or whatever, mm-hmm. then, you know, you'd see the similarities yeah, absolutely. kind of emerging. Yeah. 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 But uh, what comes across, I think, from all three talks, so correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, uh, the emphasis that we as educators support in redesign and assessment. Uh, so, uh, okay, all the technical infrastructure about plagiarism and proctoring and uh, online evaluation software and all this kind of thing might be important, but without uh, the, the, the important kind of very important aspect of redesign and assessment, redesigning any, any exams or any other form of assessment, format of assessment you're going to use, they're not useful enough. They create a superficial environment which sometimes can be ethically very, very dubious as far as the students are concerned. So uh, I'm glad that there seems to be a, a convergence from all three uh, uh, presentations about this, this, quite a, uh, this quite strong emphasis on redesign and assessment. Yeah. And I mean, and the other thing that I, I didn't sort of talk about here, but we went through a, a rigorous process now it's kind of we didn't do so much this year, but like when we were re- redesigning it, everybody had to had, had a buddy who had to review review the paper, and then I reviewed them from my school, and then we reviewed them at a faculty level, and we were saying we're doing this questions and timing. So there was a kind of a control process put in, in place so that Orna wouldn't say, mm, kind of like the sound of this question, and I'm going to go with this. And um, so there was, and now the exam, the subsequent exams, once they have kind of the template. Of how to do things um it's it's you know we can kind of 
run itself a little bit, but I think that piece of somebody overseeing and not just Monica having a mad idea and doing this question, like, so there was the buddy, there was there was me, and then there was a, the kind of um, a dean appointed person at a faculty level going through all the kind of the procedures, how much time you're doing, are you doing MCQs? Um, and like we spotted, you know, there's colleagues were saying bad stuff like if, well, I wrote the question, they have 20 questions. I'll give them, I'll give them 20 minutes to do it. Like, I mean, you know, I mean, it took me five to do it. And I'm thinking like you designed the questions, you are the experts in the field. It would take you at least a minute to read each question. And, you know, if the MCQs are, the distractors are sufficiently robust, you know, so it, it's kind of a, um, managing um, colleagues' expectations. And the other important thing I think as well was it was really important to give students an exam, an example of what the exam would look like. So that if they were used to this kind of normal exam paper from last year and using that as their guideline, when they move to this year and it's completely different, even just the, the physical look and feel of it is different. They kind of think, oh, I'm, you know, so it was really important to maybe not for every single question, but like that example I gave of the, the avocados in Chile or China or whatever it was, just to get in the sense of normally you'd be asked to calculate it. But here we are giving you the answer and you can kind of work out which way it is. And then you can see for each student, yours is avocados, mine is oranges, and the country is Spain rather than Chile or whatever it is. Um, so that kind of, so you're asking the same thing really, but it looks superficially different. I thought that quality assurance bit that you brought in, Monica, that, that bit was really good. Inez is patiently um, waiting to, with sorry, her hand up there. The sorry, question. Inez. Going back to one of the first questions about the, the um, students with disabilities, because we, at UNED, we have a... Um, big experience with that. We have uh, many students with disabilities in Spain study at UNED. So we have a special unit for supporting their, their needs and their demands. And I don't have the data about their performance last year, but using all, all information from my course, I can say that the assessment rate was 100%. So all the students with disabilities it, having the online exam was good for them. They, they had a bigger opportunity to undertake the exam for mobility issues like the, I think it was more, uh, Linda who mentioned that, people who can't go easily to the regional center to take the exam. Um, all, all the students with disability do the exams. But this year I had, um, it seems that sometimes of vision problems, I don't know exactly what type of blind students uh, the platform has some accessibility issues that had to be solved. So it doesn't mean that they can't take the exam, but they don't feel confident enough there. So then these students can, can go to the regional center to take the, exams, the exam face-to-face. -face -face. Any student, students with disabilities or students that anticipate and have, they can have a internet connection problems or any other difficulty in the online platform, they can apply to go to the regional center to take the exam. It is a minority, but it is still happening. So the regional centers are open for that. And about the, um, the project to redesign the, the assessment method, uh, I'm happy to see that it's it's very common in all the in all our cases because in, in in my university there is a debate between some faculty who are claiming to go back as soon as possible to the traditional face-to-face -face exam. And, and others, including the, uh, the Center for Distance Education, they are trying to rethink uh, all, all the assessment and providing some guidelines, including this one you just mentioned of, of uh, giving examples of questions to the students so they don't feel anxious before the exam. Um, and also the university is organizing a series of, of webinars where UNED faculty, they they share what they have done specifically in their course. So in the specific uh, areas and with specific types of assessment. So they are sharing that. And, and it's, uh, it's really useful to, to share that, those experiences. I think we could be here all night talking about this. It's great, a great discussion. Um, so I, I'm going to, I think I'll bring it to a close because we're, we're, we've gone 24 minutes over. <laughs> um, but listen, I'd like to thank the speakers, uh, Monica, Linda, Stilianos and Inez. Really interesting. And I, it's it's strange considering how 
quite different contexts in some cases and different countries, but very similar conversations, especially around the academic integrity, the timing, uh, students with disabilities. It's, it's, it's astonishing in some ways how similar uh, some of the experiences are. Um, so thank you very much for, for your contributions. Uh, thank you very much to those who attended. Uh, great participation via chat and YouTube. And we look forward to seeing you at our next Eden webinar. Thanks and bye. Thanks very much. Bye, everybody. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you all. Bye. Bye-bye.